Well, good morning, everyone, and it's great to be again in God's house, especially at this time of the year. And like we've heard this morning, we've had testimonies whereby we can praise God for the way he's led in our past life, uh, past year, I should say. And, and of course, um, when, I, when I just look out over the sanctuary this morning, I personally give God thanks because there's new people here. There are visitors and friends who are yet to become our brothers and sisters. And for those that are now members of our church and have gone through the uh, through the uh, process of baptism, I just give God thanks and praise. Amen? We've got a lot to thank the Lord for. And I thank God that our brother Basil is here too after his illness and that we can hear the beauty of his violin uh, each Sabbath morning. So again, we have a lot to thank the Lord for. Just this week, oh, we were visiting um, with friends celebrating uh, Christmas, as everyone has done. And um, he said, you know, something happened to me this week that was very interesting. And I said, oh, yeah, what was that? He said, I had a lady, a young lady, come and knock on my door. And, of course, she was of a religious persuasion, right? And uh, after listening to her for a while, he just simply said to her, he said, look, he said, I'm the, a member of the Anglican Church. But he says, I've got dear friends who are Seventh-day Adventist. And he said, if I joined your church, they'd kill me. Um, and I said, that's true. But uh, we're, we're, not so, we're not so bad. But uh, isn't it nice to realize that people are quite aware of what we believe and the trust that they have in us? So our prayer, of course, is one day that he will also become a member of our church. And um, some of you have um, realized that Facebook has also declared a secret. But um, that ham that was on the table, that was just a cadaver that I was about to bury, not to eat. So I just wanted to put that straight, uh, straight uh, for you. Um, you know, when you celebrate Christmas with other people, they eat all sorts of things, don't they? All right, my message this morning, um, and I won't just tell you, uh, you'll hear it, but uh, this morning as we come to the end of the year, and uh, we're about to bridge the gap between 2012 and 2013, we can really look back and reflect on all that God has done for us on a personal level and collectively as a church. He has really blessed us. And hopefully we can praise God in all aspects of uh, being able just to simply glorify his name for everything he's done. And I can do that from the bottom of my heart because God is so good to each and every one of us. All glory and honor be Him to him. Amen. He sustains our lives with one breath at a time, one heartbeat at a time, and one thought at a time. And that thought, hopefully, is a thought of gratitude, gratitude towards him. As this year draws to a very rapid end, remember that all ends have mostly new beginnings. For it is now that as we begin to start off again that we don't start over the same as we did last year. Not the same old, same old, but uh, that we become energized and invigorized through God's Holy Spirit with a simple thought and promise to serve and live for Jesus every moment of our new year starting from now. Amen? Always remembering that as we tackle new ventures and tasks that we never forget how God has led us in the past and especially through this past year and to this very moment in time. And this morning too, I want to look at a bunch of guys who had an extreme faith and belief in their God that nothing, absolutely nothing, could move them. They were so loyal and steadfast to the gospel that they had that nothing, absolutely nothing, could budge them. And of course, this will be my prayer for you. For all of you, and of course for myself, that as we look forward to the new year, that we too can be just like them. That we can stand as they stood, no matter what happens or what comes our way in the new year, or however we may be challenged, that we can stand fast to the faith that we hold so true to our hearts. Amen. Those who tried to discourage our bunch of guys were so jealous and full of envy that they would try absolutely anything to get rid of them. And to a point, and to a degree, I suppose, I can actually understand their position um, and why they felt that way, especially the positions they held um, in, their, in their jobs and why they were so set on getting rid of our guys. 
Their downfall, however, is that they did not have the same belief in the God that these guys did. And if they did, it may have been different. And it was different afterwards. Who am I referring to? Anyone got an idea? Some whispers out there? Yeah? It's our friends of Daniel. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Wonderful men of God. And it simply says that among the children of Israel who were carried into captivity to Babylon at the beginning of the 70 years captivity were Christian patriots. Men who were as true as steel to principle. Who would not be corrupted by selfishness but who would honour God at the loss of all things. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? Are we going to be the same in 2013? In the land of, the, of their captivity, these men were to carry out God's purpose by giving to heathen nations the blessings that came through having a knowledge of Jehovah, Jehovah God. They were to be his representatives. Never were they to compromise with idolaters, their faith and their name as worshippers of the living God. They were to bear as a high honour, and this they did. We never know what's going to happen in 2013. Are we going to hold God's name in high honour? In prosperity and adversity, they honoured God, and God honoured them. The fact that these men, worshippers of Jehovah, the true God, were captives in Babylon, and that the vessels of God's house had been placed in the Babylonian temple was boastfully stated by their victors as evidence that their religion and customs were, were superior to the religion and customs of the Hebrews. Yet through the very humiliation that Israel's departure from him, from him God presented, God gave Babylon every evidence of his supremacy, of the holiness of his requirements, and of the sure results of obedience and this testimony he gave through those who were loyal to him one day well even today we have to carry the testimony of Jesus Christ and are we going to be loyal to him who gave it to us among those who maintained their allegiance to God were Daniel and his three companions illustrious examples of what men may become who unite with God of wisdom and power from the comparative simplicity of their Jewish home, these youth of royal line were taken to the most magnificent of cities and into the court of the world's greatest king, greatest monarch, King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar spoke unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, eunuchs, and he said he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well favoured and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and in understanding science, and such as they had the ability in them, were able to stand in the king's palace. And of course, who did he choose? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Seeing in these young people the promise of remarkable ability, King Nebuchadnezzar determined that they should be trained to fill important positions in his kingdom. That they might be fully qualified for their life work. He arranged for them to learn the language of the Chaldeans, the Babylonian language, and for three years to be granted the unusual educational advantages afforded only to his princes of his realm. The names of Daniel and his companions were changed to names representing Chaldean gods. Great significance was attached to the names given by the Hebrew parents to their children. Often these stood for traits of character that the parent desired to see developed in the child. The prince in whose charge the captive youth were placed gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. And of course we can follow the story as I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to chapter 3 of the book of Daniel. Most of us know this, uh, know these verses, know these chapters, and we know what's about to take place. King Nebuchadnezzar, who was proud of himself and his achievements, he set up a huge image, an image of gold, to which 
uh, element, his kingdom, was represented in, in prophecy. And I'd like to pick up the story in, uh, in verse 2 of chapter 3. <clears throat> and it simply says here, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sh sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. He calls all his trustful men uh, that surround him to come and help celebrate the dedication. But it's these men that are, the, that are dangerous uh, in regards to Daniel and his three friends. In verse 3, it goes on to say, Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, sorry, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. These people were bowing down to their king's image. Then a herald cried aloud to you that is commanded, O people, nations, and language, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that, Kevin, that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Amazing, isn't it? Don't we see a similar, uh, a similar form of worship today? That when people have the music hyped up, that they all fall down also and worship? And those falleth not down, and worshippers shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, salt, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. His governors, his princes, his uh, sheriffs all came and saw that the Jews, or a certain amount of the Jews, were not worshipping this image. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. Verse 11, And whosoever falls not down to worship, that he should be cast at the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Amazing, isn't it? There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, a king, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Notice what he said here. They serve not your gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before them. Notice the reaction of King Nebuchadnezzar here. He was absolutely furious and uh, wrathful at the fact that these guys didn't bow down. So Nebuchadnezzar spoke to them and said, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psalter, and dulcimer, and all the kinds of music, you shall you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the, a burning, fiery furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? This is interesting what comes next. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. In other words, we're not going to argue about it. That's a fact. We're not going to worship your gods. We only worship one God. And that's our attitude. If it be so, our God... Uh, whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thy hands, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. They actually lit a fire under Nebuchadnezzar just about. And the form of his visage was changed. He was so wild against Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Therefore he spoke and commanded that the that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. An amazing statement, isn't it? The fiery furnace was, was used uh, for this purpose, 
that when anyone didn't obey the king, he was put into the fiery furnace. But this time, it was heated more than it had ever been heated before, up to seven times. A 